If you love podcasting as much as I do, you may be considering starting your own. Starting a podcast has been one of the best decisions I have ever made, but getting started can feel overwhelming. Buzzsprout is the easiest and most professional way to start a podcast. Buzzsprout has helped over 100,000 people launch their own podcasts, including me. Buzzsprout will launch your show on all of the major podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play, to name a few. You also get a podcast website, audio players that can be dropped into other websites, and stats of who is listening, and so much more. Buzzsprout also publishes blog posts, podcasts, and YouTube videos every week. They are great tools and have useful information from expert podcasters. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in our show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that I sent you and it supports my show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Crime One and Chaos contains adult language and graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Amber. (laughs) And I'm Naomi. And this is Crime Wine and Chaos. (laughs) (laughs) What happened? We've been talking off the record for 40 minutes. And you choose the second I hit record to be like, you know what? I'm very thirsty right now. <laughs> what the fuck? Well, we'd been talking for 40 minutes. I needed a, I was parched. What like, part you know, of that does not make sense to you? I'm going to hit record. You're like, great. I'm going to take a quick shower, change my shoes. I'm like, wait, no. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> Order my DoorDash. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I am a little peckish. I do need a snack. Oh my God. That was awesome. I love that so much. Oh, hello. Hi, Hi sister. How are you? Hi. Hi. I'm okay. How are you? Oh, I'm also just okay. Just okay? I mean, okay. So, yeah. Um, I'm currently looking for a new place to live, as you know. Oh, yes, yes. You yep. sent me that crazy, weird listing. Yeah, that was the thing I was going to say first is someone stole our house. So let's start there. Oh, someone else happen. got it. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it was funky and weird and gigantic. So that makes sense. You know how it's one of those things where it starts off like kind of exciting and fun. And then very quickly, it's like, man, this is like a part-time job. Exhausting. It's just exhausting. Yeah. And also like Michael and I have a spreadsheet going now and there's so many that it's like, he's like, Oh, we're going to see the one, you know, the one with the blue mailbox. I'm like, no, you know, it's like <laughs> these weird little cues to try and remember what I don't even fucking care anymore. I'm like, does it have a roof? Let's just, let's just be done. Just, just go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it weirdly feels like very classist contest. I don't know. Like, I don't know what private owners are doing. Like you qualify, but these people are cooler. I- I'm not sure. Oh, sh- you know yeah, 100%. What I mean? Oh, it's totally. Like- there's like a, there's like a vibe check. It's like, yeah, no, I, I, I get it. I yeah, get it. it I was- mean, technically it's not supposed to be like, it's like illegal to do that, but like they all do that. Of course. And it felt this way when I was uh, on them looking to buy a home. It's like, yeah, these people, especially in this area, are just coming in with like, well, I have 50,000 cash for down payment. It's like, well, I can't fucking compete with that. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. And it's like, I've got other things going on. Do you have to just like be on it constantly and just, I don't know. It's too much. It's too much. It's rough out there. Mm -hmm. It's rough out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, may the odds be ever in your favor. Are you volunteering as tribute? (laughs) <laughs> i me? have to i i you do not want me to be the one you do not Mm-mm. want me to be the one i'm telling you right now no i can't even imagine you know what i haven't moved in like 11 years so i i i don't even know what that would look like at this point i it sounds like i might i'll just die in my weird little mother-in-law it's fine <laughs> first off your mother-in-law isn't weird it's adorable also i didn't move for 10 years either and in the last five years i feel like i have moved a lot and it's unsettling. You have moved a lot. You've mm-hmm. moved three times and you're on the verge of a fourth. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of work. Moving is really disruptive. I'm sorry, sissy. What it's are a- you drinking tonight? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, I'm actually drinking. It's called Los Andes. It's a cab from Argentina, a 2022. It's delicious. Um, it's a great. It's a one glasser for me. It's pretty robust 
you know? Okay. Okay. But, so. Is that one of your uh, wine of the month things or whatever? My splash wine order. You got it. Splash yeah. wine. We got to get, you know what? We got to get you sponsored. We got to get the splash wine sponsored. <laughs> I agree. If they knew how much I plugged their wine on this show. God. Well, you know, maybe we'll some, maybe someday. Mm-hmm. Big, dream big. Dream big, sissy. Thank you. Um, mm-hmm. You've mm-hmm. got your, your water. My water, you know. Great. You know me. I actually, I had a, uh, one of those crazy nights where I had a bunch of dreams that involved drugs, which is always really, really weird and unsettling and strange. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, you know, then I woke up and remembered that that didn't happen. It was just a dream. I'm still clean. (laughs) Good for you. God, that is unsettling. God. Well, you know, it's interesting too, because when you start out in recovery, you have using dreams, like actual using dreams where you're like using and it's like very real and you wake up and you're like, oh my God, did I get loaded? And then you realize, no, I was just dreaming. And you have this big sigh of relief. Like, and as for me, as I've like, the longer I've stayed clean and the more like I've worked on my recovery, um, it's like recovery comes into play. So it's like, for a lot of years, it was like, I would get these dreams where in the dream I had gotten loaded, but like, I, I was already loaded. I didn't dream about actually doing it. I just knew that I was already. And then I was like around all these people that I know in recovery and like keeping it a secret from them. And like, oh. I'm not going to tell anybody. I just did that that one time and it'll be fine. And no one has to know. Mm. Last night it was, I like lost a day. I couldn't remember a whole like event. And the person I was with was like, oh, well, that's what happens when you do this drug. And I was like, livid what do you mean I did a drug? And I was like, I'm in recovery. I don't do drugs. It was very strange. Oh, but anyway, no. dreams are weird. Yeah. <laughs> Dream, dreams are weird. Fuck. That is upsetting. Uh, you get used to it, you know. Yeah, I guess you your subconscious probably does, you know, weird, weird shit to you. Yeah. God. Jeremy told yeah, me well, once of like the spookiest dream he ever had, which was in the red room at grandma Kitty's house, which is like, first off, of course it was. Cause that's, yeah, of course it was. That's yeah. Where, that's the spooky room. That's the yep. spooky room. And he said that he had this um, movie poster on his wall at the time. And he was like, he had fallen asleep and in his dream, he was looking at this movie poster which was like a poster for a horror movie. And it kind of had like a blood drippy thing going on it or whatever. But in his dream, the blood spelled out, wake up. And then he woke up. What? Yeah. Isn't that fucking creepy? That is really weird. I don't like it. I don't like it either. I don't like it. Oh, Mm -hmm. that reminds me of a story I heard the other day when I was listening to the late one of the newer episodes of Odd Trails, which if you're not listening to Odd Trails, I was going to talk to you about Odd Trails today. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's so good. Mm -hmm. It's so good. It's so good. Speaking of things that we're supposed to be talking about, we have not talked about Delphi. Let's do it because I've been listening to the same non updates from there's no updates. Mm hmm. Everybody's just like, let's rehash and let's make all these speculations because we don't have any actual information. And I am just dying for information. And I don't think we're going to get any for a while. Not until there's a trial. Um, yeah, I was listening to Murder Sheet today, which they have okay. they have taken a deep dive into that. And um, one of their hosts is an attorney and he had his arraignment and all of the court files are sealed, which is uh, yep. unprecedented and unusual. And this attorney had reached out to his law professor so that he could take a deep dive into Indiana law. And there is um, a stipulation in their public disclosure law about like if it will jeopardize a case or be dangerous to the public or whatever, that the judge has the discretion of not releasing documents to the public that would otherwise be um, subject to public disclosure. And so do you think that has to do with not tainting a jury pool? Maybe I don't know, because they keep saying that it's an ongoing investigation and they've sort of alluded to there's a possibility that he wasn't operating by himself. Oh, like maybe there's somebody else involved. Mm -hmm. And Indiana has these weird law. Well, I don't know if it's weird, but they don't have degrees or things like accomplice or anything like that. It's just murder. And so even if this guy that they arrested somehow played a part in it, but didn't actually carry out the act, that that would still be a murder charge. And so I don't know. I don't know. They know they've always known a lot more than what they've told the public. 
Um, well, yeah. I mean, they've known that it was somebody in the community. They've, they've known that it was, you know, that it was somebody nearby. They've no, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that they do know. I'm also really curious because there was definitely indications along the way. Cause I've listened to a few different podcasts who've done deep dives, the guys over at true crime garage who are actually the ones that I got my chaos story from today. They are like obsessed with Delphi. They've done many, many, many episodes about Delphi and the updates along the way. And there was definitely, uh, indications early on and i've heard them talk about this that there was stuff at the crime scene that was indicative of like details about the crime scene that would have been kept from the public Mm -hmm. uh, that were indicative of like posing or trophy taking or some kind of like very specific like mo Mm. almost serial killer style that they were trying to keep in their back pocket so that they could you know only the murderer would know kind of thing. Right. And that's smart. That does make sense. But I imagine it's hard to sort of have that balance of doing that. But also like a lot of times it is the public that helps you. And, um, yep. and I, and even with like the, the video that was taken on Abby's phone, I think from what I've heard there, there's actually like 45 seconds and they released right. like three seconds of it. And even in those yep. three seconds, you can tell that it's, clipped together yep the guys is from something else i think yep and down the hill Mm -hmm. is a different audio yeah and so it's just frustrating like do you recognize this voice it's like well somebody might have if you would give us a little more of a sample but yeah you know but it's tough i i get it i uh well uh, I know that you and I both are uh, on pins and needles for more Mm -hmm. information on this one this one has been uh crazy uh, unsolved murder for too long. And, uh, I'm ready for some, I'm ready for some answers. Me too. I'm also, I'm also ready to hear what kind of crime story you have for me today. Oh, well, fuck sister. I've got one that's going to make you mad. (laughs) You know, you're really good at that. I feel like there's a pattern here. Okay. But listen, Okay, Look, but- I'm ready to be mad. I've been on Twitter all week watching Elon Musk just destroy the company that he was forced to buy for $44 billion. So mm-hmm. bring it, bring mm-hmm. it. Okay, well, I don't think I'm going to bring it to that level, but I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> all right. I'm okay. going to tell you about the murder of Lori Nesson and also uh, sprinkled in there of Karen Adams. Okay. Okay. All right. So a couple is picking apples in a field that's like runs alongside the road. When they discover what they think is a mannequin in a ditch. It's never a mannequin. It's never a mannequin. Um, This couple is in Reynoldsburg, Ohio, just 13 miles east of Columbus. And it is September 1974. Oh, okay. So get, they get closer and they realize it's not a mannequin and it's the body of a girl. Mm -hmm. So they flag down a driver. They tell him, go call the police. Police arrive in minutes and they find a naked female face up in a ditch. Do you hear that? The police are hear coming. what? Oh, I thought you could hear the sirens in the background. I was no. like, God, cute. I was like, so the police <laughs> arrive and then it's all, Woo! I'm like, whoa. <laughs> we have sound effects now. I know. Wake up. I know. That's just my soundboard. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so there weren't any immediate uh, visible clues as to the cause of her death. And there seems to be only minor marks on her body. She had some bruising on her left arm and a wound on her head. And there were no clues in the area around her body. And it appears as though she was killed somewhere else and dumped there because the scene was pretty undisturbed. Okay. And also the girl had no dirt on her feet. So she was not walking around outside at all. Um, And she was barefoot. She was totally nude. Okay. Yeah. So it looked like whoever had, done this to her, just pushed her out of the car and kept on going. Ugh. Yeah. Police, they have, they have no idea who this girl is, so they send out a teletype, because it's 1974. Right. Stating that the victim was between 15 and 18 years old, 5 feet tall, and 100 pounds, with brown eyes mm-hmm. and short brown hair. So they share this information with the media, and very quickly someone calls in. And the caller says that the description of this girl sounds like her friend who had gone missing the night before. The caller says that her friend is 15-year-old high school sophomore Lori Nesson. Okay. 
So they contact Lori's mom and they are able to determine that their victim is in fact Lori. Mm. I know. So Lori's mom and her younger sister, who was 13 at the time, Tony, they are absolutely devastated. Tony describes Lori as beautiful, artistic, and deeply empathetic. And she said that Lori had a way of talking with people that made them feel like they were talking to a best friend. Even at the age of 15, she just put people at ease and people just naturally gravitated towards her and felt safe opening up to her. Mm. She sounds adorable. Yeah. So on that Friday night, Lori had gone to a local football game and then to a party at her classmate Scott's house afterwards. She ended up leaving the party around 11 p.m. and went on to two more parties. And she was seen by several of her classmates at all three parties that night. The last party of the night was on Harding Road, which was just a few blocks from her house. Is she driving or walking to these parties? She, I think she is getting rides to the parties. Uh, but then um, the last party where she's just a few blo- blocks from her out- house, she um, she gets to the last party at around 11 p.m. And a classmate offers to drive her home when she says that she's ready to go home. But Lori's like, nah, I just want to, I just want to walk. It's just a few blocks. Ugh. I know. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know. And so she leaves the party around midnight and there were several friends that saw her leave the party walking in the direction of her house, which is like a few blocks away. Yeah. And they're like in a neighborhood in the suburbs. Right. And right. The entire walk is through a neighborhood. There's no cutting through the woods or cutting through a parking lot. It's just neighborhood. It's just like a few blocks over in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Got it. But she never made it home. So at that time that she left the party, she was wearing a red V-neck sweater, blue jeans and beige shoes. It was the seventies and it was blue jeans with like colored stitching. It was like a really cute outfit. With Aww. beige shoes and a little sweater. So cute. Oh, well, 70s are back. I know. I know. I love it. So when her story hits the news, a tip comes in from another young woman who says that she saw Lori when she was driving home and that Lori was on the side of the road next to a small red car. But she didn't think anything of it. She said that the girl didn't seem to be in trouble or distress. She just saw someone on the side of the road while she was driving by. So police start asking Lori's friends who in their group drives a red car. And they learn that Scott, the party host, sometimes drives his parents' red car. And they question Scott. And he says that he was home all night. And his parents verified this story. And that he said after his friends left and the party was over, he hung out with his parents for a bit and then went to bed. Was Scott's party the last party she was at? Or was it one of the two before? It was the first party. Got it. So then someone calls in and said they found clothing strewn out over a stretch of road, not too far from where Lori's body was found. Um, Detectives go and collect the clothing and they are able to positively identify them as Lori's. Okay. Mm -hmm. They note that there are stains on the jeans consistent with bodily fluids, but it's the seventies and DNA isn't a thing. So they bag up the clothes and put them into evidence. Yeah. Then uh, the Reynoldsburg police get a call from Columbus PD and they learn about a guy named Eugene Gway. And Gway had several convictions of sexual assault and he's a known predator in the Columbus area. So the Reynoldsburg police bring him in for questioning. And when they show him a photo of Lori, he says, quote, she would have been my kind of girl. Gross. Ew. Wa- yeah. No way, Gway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> well, you know that's going to be the one now. That's going to be the one from now on. No way, Gway. He's in his twenties and her... she's fifteen. It's fucking gross. Ugh. So gross. I mean, he's yeah, he's gross. But yep, um, clearly. So they ask him point blank if he killed her, and he says no. And he provides a detailed alibi for the night Lori went missing, and he has several witnesses to corroborate his story. And he even voluntarily allows the police to search his car, which is not a red car, and they find nothing. Okay. So, yep. I mean, he sucks, but he didn't kill Lori. So, you know. I'm still, I'm still looking at Scott. Okay. All right. This is where you're going to get mad. Okay. So, I mean, if you weren't already. 
So okay. then the detectives get notice from the coroner's office that the seasoned coroner who was conducting Lori's autopsy suddenly passed away. What? Yeah. It, okay. And he was replaced by an extremely inexperienced coroner. Great. Mm-hmm. I love an inexperienced coroner. I <laughs> <laughs> me too of all i mean i've met a lot of inexperienced coroners they're my favorite kind of people you know that that's like actually like a like like a like a like a silent epidemic in this country right is that like a lot of coroners positions are actually elected positions mm-hmm. and there's these like coroners that go around and like take these coroner positions who actually are not qualified to be coroners coroners at all yeah and they've like fucked up like tons of investigations by making up bullshit autopsy reports and shit uh yeah uh, that was exactly what we were gonna get to was great what is the fucking vetting process for a coroner and what are we doing so several weeks later the baby coroner comes back with a cause of death as asphyxiation by an undetermined origin aka sudden death what grown-up sids what she just died she just died sudden adult death yeah what Uh uh-huh and the manner of death is undetermined stop it aka not homicide well undetermined can't doesn't rule out homicide but it also doesn't specifically in like in determine that it's homicide okay I'm sorry, though. She's naked and in a ditch. Of course, it's homicide. You, oh, no. I I am not. I am not arguing that. I'm just saying that if they put undetermined, they can't close the case. Uh, that's actually exactly what happened was because. No. Yes. Because it wasn't listed as a homicide. There is no homicide investigation. Shut the fuck up. Not Okay. Not one single, not one single detective thought, you know, I don't think that this is something other than a homicide. Um, no, I, I don't know if they did or didn't. Um, but that was what happened was that the coroner's oh report my... shut down the investigation. Oh my fucking God. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but nobody tells Lori's family that. Oh, <gasps> Oh my God. If you don't think that this world hates women. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't until 32 years later. Oh my God. mm -hmm, At the age of 45, Lori's sister, Tony requested her sister's case file. And that is the first time that she learns about the coroner's report. What? Uh Uh-huh. I don't know what happened in the interim. And they also don't touch on mom. I mean, Tony was 13 at the time. And I don't, I don't think that mom is still alive now. And who fucking knows what, I mean, when you lose a child like that, who knows? I don't know. Right. Either way, they weren't um, staying on top of it. They were trusting that the system was working and it wasn't, is what (sighs) I gathered. So yeah, at 45, she's like, I want to know what happened to my sister. She requests the case file. She reads the autopsy report for the first time. And she's like, what the actual fuck? But at the same time, she learns that a young patrol officer, Craig Brafford, had recently started looking through Lori's case. So he was, yeah, he was just like an evening patrol guy who was like new and eager and just happened to see it. And he sees a case from 1974 with an undetermined cause of death. And it's a 15 year old in a ditch. And he's like, what the fuck? Yeah. So he gets permission from his superiors to look into the case. And when he reads the coroner's report, he is floored. So in one section, the coroner notes trauma to the body. And in another section, he notes no trauma to the body. What? Mm -hmm. And Bradford said, quote, he was disgusted that a 15 year old was found naked in a ditch on the side of the road and it wasn't ruled as a homicide. Seriously. Yeah. So he opens the case back up and he spends hours. Yeah. Pouring over everything. And he, God, this guy's so fucking smart. He eventually comes across a photo. This is kind of triggering. He comes okay. across a photo that was taken at the scene of Lori's body. And in this photo, another detective is holding her lip up 
to get a photo of the inside of her mouth. And when Bradford like zooms in and looks really closely at it, he can see injuries inside of her mouth consistent with the inside of her lip being cut up from her braces. So he oh. knows that this means that she was manually asphyxiated by being smothered. Oh, wow. I know. Fucking genius. Right. So he takes the case and his findings to the current coroner. And on September 17th, 2020, her manner of death is changed from undetermined to homicide, which allowed the oh, investigation for- to be officially open. Oh, my God. Uh, I know. I, oh, I'm i assuming this is a different coroner by now. I would hope so. Baby coroner should have been <laughs> fucking fired. Seriously. God. Do you think? Okay. First off, I have a coroner. I'm going to sound real stupid, but I'm just going to flaunt my ignorance here. That's different than a Great. medical examiner. Yes or no? I think that that essentially it's the same but i think the coroner is basically like the boss the coroner runs the show so like a medical exam a coroner is a medical examiner but i believe like if you're just called the medical examiner like you work for the coroner Hmm. i think the coroner is the official person who has to like sign off on the autopsies right that like makes the calls i don't know you know as much as i do okay I have, I'm guessing. I used to see when I worked in the courts, um, I think actually what they would call this is a coroner's inquest is what they call okay. it when they want to revisit an autopsy report and sometimes actually like dig up a body. It's called a coroner's right. inquest. Also, I'm thinking like you're a baby coroner, right? Uh-huh. Okay. I'm thinking from my perspective, the way my brain works. I'm a baby coroner. My like predecessor has passed and now I've become a coroner like brand new how rad is that and like the first job like the first case i get is clearly like a a murdered young woman and i'm not taking the opportunity to dig in on that Mm -hmm. and do right by her yeah that's weird to me well and also when you're in a position like that it's like where are your mentors it's kind of like what I was just talking about with the Delphi, that podcast where one of the hosts is an attorney and he still reached out to his law professor, who is the smartest attorney he knows and said, explain to me what's happening here. I'm sure he could have figured it out on his own, but it's like, Hey, like I want to do right by this. So where's, where's my people that taught me or that trained me? You know what I mean? To I do know what you mean. Set of eyes on this so that I don't know. God damn it. Baby coroner. What are you doing? Seriously. Seriously. Uh Uh-huh. So it's reopened and they go to the media and they make a public plea and they ask if anyone can recall anything from that night um, in 1974. And within 10 minutes, calls start coming in. And one of those callers is Teresa Chamberlain. Okay. And in 1975, Teresa's 17-year-old cousin, Karen Adams, was murdered in the neighboring town of Whitehall. And the killer's method was identical. Oh. Mm-hmm. This And so this was a year later, less than a year later. Right. Also, side note, like, somebody else is dead because of Baby Corner. But. Yep. So there's that. Um, the killer's method was identical. So she was walking home at night. She was later found naked, sexually assaulted, and asphyxiated on the side of the road. <sighs> And this murder was six months and four miles away from Lori's, but the neighboring jurisdictions didn't know about each other's cases at the time, so a connection was never made. Fucking jurisdictions. Fucking jurisdictions. It's like planting your flag like this is my section. It's so weird. I can't. I can't. I can't. I cannot. The person is in a car. They can get out of your arbitrary lines that you have drawn on a map and go... (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. They're not, (laughs) they're not confined to your jurisdiction anyway. Mm. So in 2012, DNA evidence showed that Karen was assaulted and killed by two men, Charles Weber and Robert Meyer. Oh, her case was solved. They had uh, an MO of picking up young girls in their small red car. Oh no. Yep. And they would take turns sexually assaulting the girl in the car and then dump them off on the side of the road. 
And at the time of Lori's murder, the two were living together in Ohio. Fucking gross. But unfortunately, by 2020, when they're reinvestigating Lori's case, both men were already dead. Of course. One died in prison and the other, I don't, we don't care. It doesn't matter. But this is another like weird uh, things that should not even, but weird miracles keep happening in the Reynoldsburg police because um, when they took Lori's clothing because they didn't even know that DNA was a thing, they, threw her clothing in a bag and they didn't preserve it in a way that you would with evidence that you think might have DNA on it. Yeah. So it's a long shot, but they still have her clothes. They get it, uh, the jeans out, they send it to the lab and they are able to pull two uh, male DNA samples from it. And both of them are a match to the two deceased men who killed Karen Adams. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, of course, like Tony is overjoyed and um, Detective uh, Bradford, he went and told Tony personally that they had a match and that her case was solved and closed. And, of course, that the men were dead. And, yeah, fucking a board patrol officer and some sort of miracle at the DNA lab and Teresa Chamberlain seeing that on the news and thinking, like, that sounds eerily similar. I mean... This is not how it's supposed Mm -mm. to happen, though, right? Mm -mm. Like coincidences and board beat cops and random chance on evidence still being preserved. I mean, this it's like uh, too too many like random events had to happen in order for that crime to be solved. I know. First off, how the fuck is yeah? I can't get past like. She did not die of natural causes and end up naked in a ditch. What the fuck? Nope. What are we talking about, baby corner? Oh, my God. But also, like, weirdly, because we were just talking about Delphi and the um, holding back of all the evidence is like, this is another example of like, within 10 minutes of them making their what they knew public, Teresa Chamberlain called in and said, I think I have some information, you know? Yep. I don't know. It's tough balancing thinking that you might be ruining a case by doing that, but also you could be, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, I don't know if you've been watching the new, the new season of unsolved mysteries, but it's just a series of like, you know, where the fuck are the cops? Why don't they ever want to do their job? Like, why don't they want to solve crime? It's, it's, it's infuriating. It's infuriating. It's like they just don't want to do the work. It's so weird. Our like our close rate in the United States, like across like when you aggregate it all together is like less than 50 percent or something on murders. It's it's crazy. Hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, I every and it seems like every chance that detectives have to dismiss something is either not a murder or. Like they're constantly want to just call it a suicide when it's clearly not like, you know, it's like that lady who was found like dangling from her balcony. Yeah. That's the story? party. Is it the lady uh, that went to the party and was, Oh no, that that's a bit- no, this was the woman in the big fancy house, I think down in Southern California mm-hmm. and she was found oh, dangling yes. from her own balcony yes. upside it, it, we, it was all weird it was all weird and they were like oh that's a suicide yes what? i do know what you're and talking about and she was about. like it was all just so weird and there was no way it was a suicide but it was like you know who cares it's and a suicide like prior and to, to that go. her stepson was weirdly injured in the house on yes. her watch and i think that yes she, maybe her partner was mad at her about that something or her yes. their his family or something mm-hmm. yes i know exactly what you're you talking know about what i'm talking about anyway it just happens all the time it, it does there was that other one that was we- really famous and i think it was in georgia and this woman went to like an adult women's sleepover <gasps> with like who she yes was- yes yes and she was found dead outside the next morning and they all just said oh it was an accident or it was suicide and it was like no something went down here with yeah. you broads mm-hmm. yep the only yep. black woman at the party. 
Yep. And I think they said that like she was a smoker. She must have gone out for a smoke and fallen off the deck. Like nobody just goes yes. out for a smoke and falls off the deck. And also, I don't think people, she might be injured, but she's not going to be dead from falling off the deck into the grass. Like what the right. fuck happened? It was, I know. Well, I mean, so the the unsolved mysteries one that just really riled us up was the one about the gal who was found on the train tracks, Aww. and it was like she was a teenager. She had just graduated, or she was like eighteen. She had just graduated. She there, at, there was just no evidence to suggest that she wanted to die, and they ruled it a suicide. And it was like there's no way this was a suicide Mm -hmm. there is no way Mm -hmm. and so no 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 authority is investigating it because they called it a suicide and walked away it's like it happens all the time it's really infuriating johnson they ruled it an accident you know that one in the gym mat yep in the gym mat yep Uh, anyway yeah let's just keep getting fucking mad (laughs) yep appreciate it thank you sissy you're welcome that was a that was a doozy (sighs) oh Yeah. I'm glad it got solved, though. I I'm really too. glad it got solved. Like, I'm really happy for her sister I that she too. has some answers. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you. Thank you for that, sissy. You're I welcome. appreciate you. Mm-hmm. I love I love coming on here for you to piss me off. Mm. It's great. You're welcome. It's great. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I have some chaos for you. Okay, great. Um, I just to caveat this. So I mentioned this earlier. I originally heard the story on the true crime garage. Those guys are like the ones I was telling you about that are like Delphi obsessed. Um, they're not everybody's cup of tea, but I like them. I like the way that they tell their stories. They do really deep dives on stuff. They do. They'll do multi-parters and stuff, depending on how much information there is to share. You know, mm-hmm. they do nice, real long, deep dives and stuff. Um, so they're the only ones of the podcasts I listen to that have covered this. And it's a little bit um, different because it's it's probably not a crime, which is one of the reasons why I'm telling it to you as a chaos story. And I think I think you'll understand when we get to the end why I chose to do this and why I consider this chaos. So, um, okay. oh, this one is uh, I'm calling the story What Happened to Noah Donahoe. Okay. Do you know the story? Okay. Nice. That name sounds so, familiar. Okay. So the story takes place in Belfast in Northern Ireland in June of 2020. Okay. So a few months after like ha- hardcore lockdown. So we're doing another like, you know, height of the beginning of the pandemic story here. Um, Sunday, the 21st of June. Noah Donahoe, who is a 14-year-old boy living with his mother, Fiona, in South Belfast. Um, he is uh, he's of mixed heritage. His father, who lives in the U.S. now, was originally from Senegal. And Fiona is raising Noah on her own. Okay. So around 545 that Sunday evening, Noah hops on his bike wearing his black skating helmet and carrying his backpack containing his laptop and some books. And he is supposed to be heading to Cave Hill Country Park to meet up with a group of his friends who are also his classmates. And they're working on a project together. And this ride to this park is one that Noah has done many, many times. Mm -hmm. This is a regular thing for him to meet up with his friends at this park. Noah and his friends all attend St. Malachy's College, which is a private all boys school founded in 1833. The project they're working on is for the Duke of Edinburgh Award, which is like some big thing, like hundreds of thousands of kids take part in every year across the UK. So I'll note here, Northern Ireland is a small piece on the north part of the island that is Ireland Mm -hmm. and it is, it is, it is part of the UK. It is separate from Ireland, the country, which is the rest of the Island. Um, And if this is news to you or any of your listeners, you can go read about the troubles and you can get more of an understanding of that split. So Northern Ireland is a small, uh, it's a small country. That's actually part of the United kingdom. Got it. Okay. So Actually, side note, I went to Belfast. It's a lovely town. Um, Mm -hmm. This award program, it's basically a civic self-improvement award for kids who complete the requirements at each level. And the level that Noah and his friends were on had four parts, community service, mental skill building, 
physical recreation and an adventurous journey. And the adventure needs to be completed with a group of kids working together and is pre-approved by an award leader. So I imagine there's some kind of program within this program of like mentors or leaders that kind of guide these kids through this, this whole whatever Mm -hmm. deal. Right. So um, I feel like Noah is probably taking this, this stuff pretty seriously, this Duke of Edinburgh stuff, because he was an exceptional student. He achieved multiple awards in his three years at this private school, including, including one for perfect attendance. Oh yeah. He played cello, rugby, basketball, and sang in the school choir. Jeez, like dream kid. Yeah, yeah. He is described by his school principal as the perfect gentleman with the heart of a lion. But Noah never shows up at the park to meet his friends. And he doesn't check in with his mom at 630 like he was supposed to. And this is all very out of character for Noah. Mm -hmm. So Fiona calls the police around 930 p.m., to report him missing and police realized immediately that something was definitely very wrong. Fiona told police that beyond his black helmet and backpack, Noah was wearing a khaki green North face jacket, gray sweatshorts, a blue tie dye hoodie and Nikes with a bright yellow swoosh. Wow. Fiona is really fucking on top of her shit, man. She is on top of her shit. Wow. She is a good mom. So this is really big news in Belfast and a huge search, a huge search goes underway. It's one of the biggest searches for a missing person in the history of Northern Ireland. Wow. Monday night, the day after Noah went missing, police get a call from a woman who found an abandoned bike outside the front of her house in the street the day before. It was a black Apollo mountain bike. And she had assumed that a neighbor kid had left it there. So she put it in her yard thinking the kid who left it would come back for it. Right. Mm-hmm. She, she goes to work on Monday. Here's the news about Noah's disappearance and the description of his bike and realizes it's probably the same bike as the one she found the day before. So she comes home from work to find the bike is still where she left it. No neighbor kid came back for it, so she calls it in, and the police confirm it is indeed Noah's bike. And it was in the street? It was in the street in front of her house. Wow. Okay. This road, Northwood Road, where she lives and where the bike was found, is in a residential neighborhood, and it is nowhere near Cave Hill Country Park. It's like two and a half miles away from the park that Noah was supposed to be headed to. Not anywhere on his route at all. No reason to be there. Nope. Okay. So the upside to this happening in Belfast is that there are CCTV cameras all over the city and the police have access to these. So they start pulling all the footage and piecing together what happened to Noah. They were able to find 22 separate snips of video that helped give them a good picture of the route that Noah took. And all together, they had about nine plus minutes of footage, which is about half of the amount of time that his trip lasted, which they estimated to be about 18 minutes. Okay. Okay. So his, I get, this gets weird. So he leaves his house at 5 41 PM. He goes North from his home in South Belfast towards and through the city center. He passes many major roads along the way, going at a decent clip. He's caught on camera at multiple points along the way. And then at 5 53, So 12 minutes, he passes by the art college. And at this point, he's no longer carrying his backpack. Hmm. He was on busy streets. He was caught on camera many times. There's no witnesses or evidence to suggest that he interacted with anyone, but his backpack is gone. Weird. Then he crosses the main highway that runs east to west through the city and he keeps going north. A witness says around 6 p.m. on a corner north of the highway, they witnessed a boy on a bike matching Noah's description actually fall from his bike. A car stopped. Yeah. A car stopped at the intersection and saw this and the driver got out of the car to go help him. But Noah got back on his bike and just kept on riding. Hmm. At this point, his coat is gone. The driver is saying that he wasn't wearing a coat. No, one of the video clips they have of him, like right after this report, like at 601, I think, like right after the fall was reported. The fall was not caught on camera, but he was seen on camera right after that. Okay. And he's not wearing and he's not wearing a coat. Okay. 
So a couple minutes after that, he enters Northwood Crescent. And a minute later, he is seen on CCTV again. And now he is on foot. And he is naked. What? Okay. He turns to walk between two houses in a cul-de-sac on Northwood towards the back of these two houses. And this is captured by the camera on the home of a woman on this street. She actually saw him from inside her home. He biked past and he was already naked. She saw him on his bike and was like, that kid's naked. Uh, And the home camera footage of him going between her neighbor's houses is the last footage of him before he vanished. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. So he was on foot and then back on his bike? No. So she saw him on his bike. The camera saw him on foot. Okay. So I think, right, like in that order, I think she saw him on his bike. He must have ditched it right after that and started walking. And the camera captures him walking between two houses to the back side of the houses, right? Okay. Off the street and through the side between these two houses. Oh, my gosh. The search is still going on. Tons of volunteers have turned out to help. Police are asking people in the neighborhood where Noah was last seen to search their properties and their outbuildings and such, right? Mm -hmm. And on Wednesday, someone finds his helmet and someone else finds his hoodie and his shoes lying on a wall on Northwood, that same street. They still don't have his jacket or his shorts. And as far as I can tell, these are never found. Oh, It's worth noting that none of the camera footage of Noah shows him shedding any of his clothing. Almost like. It's only happening when he's not on camera. That's really spooky because it's almost like he knows where the in-between cameras are or something. I mean, I don't know. I mean, he doesn't, but that's spooky. It is spooky. To pop up, like, I mean, I don't know how far apart these cameras are, but, like, here you are on a camera with all your stuff on, and then one block over, your backpack's gone, and then the next block over, your coat's gone. Like, that's spooky. I mean, it almost seems like that. I mean, the whole ride is, like, 18 minutes from the time he leaves his house to the time they see him walk between those houses, right? So, like, there's, and there's nine minutes of footage in between, so there's nine minutes of footage we don't see. Oh, my gosh. But it's, like... It's like, is he just like writing and like pulling this off as he's right? It's so weird. So there's lots of speculation and rumors flying, right? And 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 this will continue, well, even up to now, right? Some people ask, well, did the fall cause a brain injury? Does that explain his strange behavior? Mm-hmm. Be- but that doesn't explain him ditching the backpack because that happened before the fall off his bike. Right. His backpack and his coat. Well, no, just his backpack. So- Then on Friday, the 26th, so five days after Noah's gone missing, the police announced they have found his backpack. But it's convoluted and weird. So a known drug addict, Daryl Paul, finds the backpack leaning up against a wall. He ransacks it, finds the laptop, and immediately tries to go pawn it. The pawn shop declines to buy it. And this is on the 23rd. So this is two days after Noah's gone missing. So this would be on Tuesday. Um, At some point after all this happens, Daryl Paul gets arrested for some reason not related to this backpack situation. Probably because he's a drug addict. Who knows? Right. So he doesn't have the backpack on him when he gets arrested. So while he's sitting in jail, police get an anonymous call telling them that Paul had the backpack. Police search Paul's home find the backpack and the books, but not the laptop. They do track the laptop down and it's in the possession of a friend of Paul's. So people think, okay, this drug addict must have something to do with what happened to Noah, but police use CCTV CCTV footage again, and they confirm that Paul was nowhere near Noah when the backpack was left behind during Noah's strange bike ride. Okay. So even stranger, it turns out one of the books in Noah's backpack was 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Do you know who Jordan Peterson is? No. I'm jealous. He's awful. Oh. And he's he's revered by the manosphere. And if you don't know what the manosphere is, well, you can go look up that on your own. But suffice it to say, it's a collection of internet communities of men who fall somewhere in the Venn diagram that includes incels, 
MGTOWs, PUAs, and the type of dudes who are obsessed with being or becoming alpha males. Oh, gross. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Do you know what MGTOWs and PUAs are? No. MGTOW is an acronym, M-G-T-O-W. It stands for Men Going Their Own Way, and PUAs are Pickup Artists fucking gross i have heard of men going their own way um this is so weird and nothing about that aligns with how people described noah no it doesn't so further digging on this reveals that noah was in a dm conversation on instagram with an account that he clearly believed was the real jordan peterson himself oh And the conversation he was having there has not been released to the public. But the Belfast police went so far as to reach out to Jordan Peterson, the real Jordan Peterson, to ask about this conversation Noah was having. And Peterson explained that that account was a fake and he had not been having a conversation with the missing teen. Okay. Wow. Noah's phone was found. It was in a park playground that was on the route that he was taking. Uh, Investigations into his phone and his laptop ultimately revealed nothing. Hmm. By Thursday, the police asked the volunteer searchers to stand down. They clearly have an idea of where Noah might be, and they're trying to contain the search within the department. Okay. On Saturday, June 27th, so six days after Noah went missing, police find his body in a storm drain complex underneath the Shore Road area. Oh, no. They had been searching there for days. One of the entrances to this storm drain complex was right behind the house of the woman who found his bike. Oh, God. And this is not like the kind of storm drain that has a manhole cover or is just an opening under a curb. This is a huge drainage system with multiple access points that are covered by these big iron grates that are meant to keep the public out. Mm -hmm. Um, They're supposed to be locked, but it turns out the department who manages these drains and grates had been there to inspect the complex a few days before Noah went missing. And this particular grate had been left unlocked. It's almost like he would have to know that, though. Right? That's so Someone weird. from the department. I know. And someone from the department had come and added a padlock to it a couple days after Noah went missing because they heard that the police might be looking back there. And it looks very much like a CYA situation, you know? Mm-hmm. So the search was incredibly difficult. It is pitch black down there and there are lots of twists and turns. And also apparently this strains, this drain system is actually tidal and that the tide comes in and goes out down there. Okay. I I feel like it might even be part of managing some of the water coming in, right? The tide. Anyway, I don't know exactly. Other people can go dig deeper into these, these, drainage systems but noah's body was found over a kilometer away from the entrance that they believe he used to access the drains oh my god so all of this would explain why the police called off the public on thursday and it wasn't until saturday that he was found right Mm -hmm. noah's autopsy showed no indication of foul play And he had no visible head injuries, so that ruled out this concussion theory from the fall off his bike. Mm -hmm. And his cause of death was ruled as drowning. Huh. There was no sign of an attack or any other person being involved in his death. And it should be noted that as far as I could find out, there was no indication or reports that Noah had any mental health issues, was on any medications, had any drugs in his system or had shown any signs at all that he may be suicidal. What was the nature of the conversation in the DMS with the fake uh, Jordan? We don't know. Oh, That's the thing that they didn't release, right? We don't know. Yep. They did not tell. They did not share that. (sighs) Hmm. So in the subsequent two plus years since Noah was found, there have been hearings held to determine what happened. No charges have been brought against anyone. The police are basically treating it like a tragic accident or a suicide. Fiona, Noah's mother, is furious. She and much of the public believe that the police are shady as fuck Hmm. and not telling them everything and covering things up and and being inept. It's like all the things. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Fiona claims that his body did not have the degradation it should if it had been sitting in water for almost a week and that he was clearly murdered. Um, there's a lot of religious and racial bigotry in that area, and many people believe this was racially or religiously motivated because Noah was a person of color and a Catholic. Oh. Uh, recently, the police tried to file charges of corporate manslaughter against the Department for Infrastructure for that unsecured gate on the drain system, but it was rejected last month by the Public Prosecution Service. Um, and yeah, like I said, I... I I picked the story for chaos because by all accounts, there's no real crime here. Yeah. And the, and the whole story is just odd. It, it makes no sense. And there are no real answers. Why did Noah not go straight to that park to meet his friends? Why was he shedding clothing and belongings along his trip? Why did he get totally naked? Why did he go into that drainage system? How did he even know about the drainage system in the first place? There were residents living near it that didn't even know it existed. And when the tide started to come back in, why didn't he leave? What happened to Noah Donahoe? Jesus Christ. Okay, well, that was a fucking bummer. Um, he's 19, right? 14. Oh, I'm sorry. Fuck, 14. Um, oh, my God, that's even worse. Because what I was going to say, for boys, you know, that 19 to 25 is when the sometimes very acute, aggressive onset of schizophrenia sets in, even with no prior indication of mental health issues. Right. It almost sounds like some sort of serious, like psychotic break. It does. It but does, but it doesn't poor. make sense. It doesn't make sense. And like I said, there were residents there that didn't even know that that drainage system was there. How did he know it was there? And not only that, why was it, did he go straight back there? Like he was going straight for it. I don't know. And then my other thought And then was, it was open. Yeah. My other thought was um, whatever is in those DMs. Like, did he get caught up in some very scary, um, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, <sighs> is someone telling him to do this weird shit? Like some weird online fucking thing that he's involved with is telling him I mean, to go and do these weird things i mean <sighs> you know i don't know yes it's just all question marks mm -hmm. the whole thing from beginning to end is just question marks none of it makes sense there's no answers it's just weird god that is weird it's weird that he's popping up on cctv with, you know, different, with clothes missing, but nowhere is it catching where he's actually taking them off. Why he's taking them off is somebody else taking them off. Like, that is weird. It's all so strange. I hate it. Why did I'm you I'm sorry. That? That's my... That's my chaos story today. Well, I hate that. Um, it also gave me, do you remember <laughs> the story? I covered it a long time ago, but it's kind of famous, of Bryce uh, Las Pisa. Mm, he's missing which one is that he's the one is he the one that got a lot that like never made it home and kept calling his mom from the car and, and was, was still sitting in college. the same spot yes, yes. i am very familiar yep. with that one that's what it was making yeah. me think of of just like really fucking odd behavior that did not make sense was not their character yep. and then what the yep. hell happened yeah 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 mm -hmm. but he was like I think there's probably drugs involved. He was in college. He also like got rid of a bunch of his really like expensive stuff and gave away his like his like his game consoles and stuff to his friends. Like he was doing that thing that people talk about, but people do like before, like, before they go off the grid or decide right. to go right die by suicide. So, but like yeah, I mean it's there the was odd just behavior, no reason though the odd yeah. behavior. Yeah, oh. it's so strange. It's so upsetting. I know. I'm sorry, sissy. Well, why did you do that? Well, you know what? You always <laughs> want to make me mad. So okay, all this right. is, you know what? Turnabout's fair play. Okay. Thanks for that. I fucking hated everything Guys, about you it. You needed to know. You needed to know about Noah. Everybody needs to know yeah, about Noah. Uh, he yeah. deserves to be known. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yep. Wow. That was fucking chaos. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, okay. They can't, they can't all be, they can't all be bears. You know, no, they can't. It's all be one of those things too, where it's like you want so badly, 
like you think you're going to have an aha moment where like the snippets that we have, it's like, what the fuck? And then you want there to be a bow on it where you're like, oh, and it's not, you know, yep. that's not going to happen. Nope. Because nope. your brain can't give you any sort of like, nope. Why are, why is he miss, missing clothing every time he pops up on another camera? Like what is so, happening in between? I need to fucking know. <sighs> we'll never know. No. And even if we knew all that, we still don't know why he went into that drain. No. God. And he obviously got off his bike in the middle of the road right there and walked over to that drain. Yep. For some reason. Yeah. And nobody saw him. Well, nobody saw him get into the drain. No. But what's weirder is that that woman saw that boy naked walk between two two houses and she didn't call and tell anyone either. No. That's weird, right? Yes. It's not in the middle of like, the night. He's naked and climbing into a storm drain in a neighborhood and nobody sees that? It's weird. Well, she saw him go by naked on his bicycle. She, she definitely caught on camera him walking between the houses. I don't know when she saw that footage, mm -hmm. but she didn't think to. I don't know. It's weird. The whole thing is weird. There's no answers. It's all question marks. Yeah. I, I hate it. I'm so sorry. It's all right. Now you can be where I'm at. Now okay. Get on my level. Okay. I'm there. I've arrived. I can mm -hmm. feel it. Mm -hmm. I can feel it in my mm -hmm. soul. Well, mm -hmm. shit, sister. Uh, good story. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Do you have anything else for the good of the order? Well, I mean, if you want to go watch Twitter burn to the ground in real time with me, you can follow me at uh, Miss Nomers, which is M-I-S-S-G-N-O-M-E-R-S. -E uh, I have a good time over there. There's some fun stuff to, to be had. Other than that, no. All right, great. Uh, go check out our new logo. Thank you, Joshua. Oh, and the Davis. new logo. Joshua pulled it out. He really man. did. Kudos. Kudos it to is Joshua. So awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. He, yeah. He's he's a good friend Fucking and uh, I appreciate him. He was in yeah. my brain. Absolutely. Yeah. Trying he to articulate. It. And then he was like, I know what you're saying. Artists are weird yep. like that. You know? I mean like I don't speak yep. that language. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he knew. He knew. He knew exactly. He you. knew exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I fucking Champion. love it. Thank you for that. Fucking and, winner. Um, well, great. Um, I love you. I love you too. Thanks for having me. It was a good time. Anytime. This, sort of. Yeah, sort of. It was sort of a bleak time. So uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this was motherfucking um, chaotic. Chaotic. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Yeah. Yeah, bye. 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 Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Crime, Wine, and Chaos. The podcast art was done by Joshua M. Davis. Music by Paul Abner. You can find us on Facebook at Crime, Wine, and Chaos, on Instagram at Crime, Wine, and Chaos Pod, or check out our website at crimewineandchaos.com. Cheers. Cheers.